referred to. Mr. Thomas H. Tung, who's a lawyer, um, congressman, and the seventh mayor of Hillsborough, was in charge of Jacob Swinger's estate. And he just so happened to sell it to what would be the future eighth mayor of Hillsborough and a member of Congress Senate, William D. Hare. And I'm sure you hear you hear Field, you kind of hear the history. What's very interesting is that um, it was bought in 1886, so uh, so six years after the uh, the uh, murder of Jacob Swinger, because things had to be go through the state for seven hundred and eighty eight dollars and sixty five cents. Now, mind you, it was a parcel for over a hundred acres, so. This was this parcel was part of a much bigger parcel that was then dispersed. Um, so, uh, a native to West Virginia, William D. Hare embarked on the Oregon Trail at 19, and became, only to become the eighth mayor of Hillsborough. And so, notably about Mr. Hare, what very few people know is that his second wife, because his first wife died and died in childbirth, his second wife was the cousin of Susan B. Anthony. And uh, which is cool. pretty exciting, kind of, uh, and, and that was uh, annotated in, um, in the Oregonian upon the passing of his death. In 1891, Hare sold the land uh, along with lot, so lot eight and lot five, which is currently the Morgan and Bailey building. You can go to the next one. So this is one of the pictures we have of the original building, sometime taken between the 1890s and maybe early 1903, somewhere around there, where the balcony was still attached. And um, it was sold for $8,000, so think about that. Just, just the acreage of land, for not even, uh, I would say, an acre of land, compared to the over 100 that he got, $6,000. Now mind you, when Bailey bought the building, so Dr. Francis Alonzo Bailey was a leading physician and ninth mayor of Hillsborough. So you notice a pattern here? All, all the mayors were in on it. Also, it's by the courthouse. So there were a lot of lawyers and stuff. This building uh, evolved around a lot of them. And um, uh, Dr. Bailey, when he bought it, he bought, he bought it for $6,000. This is where when you see a jump in price for such a small piece of land, it le leads me to believe as a historian that the buildings were already there. And interestingly enough, the grates on the, ba uh, on the Morgan and Bailey building and the grates on our building are the same, which leads me to believe that they were both built at the same time. Jalila, can you tell us what the, make sure everyone knows who the Morgan and Bailey building is or which building that is? Yeah, so the Morgan and Bailey building is right here on the corner of Main Street and <coughs> 2nd, the one with the beautiful stained glass windows. And it's in the picture. And it's in the picture. Well, the, the cornice of the picture. Yeah. It has Manaya right and white birch in it. Right yes, now. yes. So it has the uh, coffee uh, house, uh, and that was built around the same time these were. So we're thinking that they were built around the same time. And now what's interesting about Dr. Francis Alonzo, when you look at the deeds, it says actually Dr. Dr. Bailey and a towel where basically there was more than one person that went into purchasing this entire this entire lot. And it was E.C. Hughes, it was also James Morgan, and Bailey. So, they, so uh, they had all come together to purchase those. Now, what few know about uh, uh, Dr. Bailey, aside from being a leading physician and ninth mayor of Hillsborough, he's also the great-grandson of General, General Wilkinson, who was appointed by Thomas Jefferson to oversee the War of 1812. And how, how that connection is made is Dr. Bailey's mother was the uh, granddaughter of General Wilkinson, who had five sons and a pair of twin daughters. So um, that said, interestingly, um, the building, and earlier when I had showed you uh, where the, the uh, Sanborn maps had sat vacant, um, which leads me to believe that it was just kind of uh, sitting there, because it literally says vacant. They didn't know what to do with it. Um, in 1893, Dr. Bailey sold the building to a certain Mrs. Mrs. Margaret A. Powell. So it went to a female and her husband. Um, from newspaper articles, the Powells are followed avidly by the public. 
Uh, so we knew that they were prominent business people. I don't know much more, so if anybody has anything on Mrs. Powell, Mrs. Margaret Powell, I'm all ears. I would love, I would love to know more. But I do know that the Powells were related to, Doc, uh, to Mr. Franklin S. Powell, who's a first-generation ox-driven pioneer of Mammoth, who basically turned into a politician. It's very interesting that all these pioneers turned into politicians. Um, in 1895, we can go to the next photo. Oh, in eight, so in 1895, Mrs. Powell sold the building, um, and in, curiously enough, in the, in the Argus in 1895, this was advertised. Mrs. Hattie Crandall and Miss Minnie Willis have opened dressmaking parlors in the brick building next door to the Argus office on 2nd Street. There weren't many bit brick buildings. So the likelihood that this is actually referring to our building and the upper dressing parlors makes a lot of sense, especially given the very flowery wallpaper that we found in our upstairs uh, area, uh, beneath, uh, hidden beneath uh, some of the layers of... Did you take a picture of the wallpaper? Yes, I do have pictures. Um, I don't have it interposed on this slideshow, but I do have, if you're interested in seeing it, um, come see me afterwards and I will definitely show you. Um, and I just absolutely love how it captures We'll be pleased to have ladies of the city and county to call on the latest fashion plates and designs. <laughs> Yay. And cutting and fitting a specialty. Call and see before leaving your order elsewhere. Everybody was looking to have their business made now. <laughs> Next slide. So the building was sold in 1895. Mrs. Powell sold it to Judge Erasmus D. Shad. Now, uh, Shattuck in 1861 became appointed by Abraham Lincoln as the district attorney. And interestingly enough, he retired from it a year later. Kind of on the down low, came back to big. And what that hints to me, because it's pre-Civil War, it's happening with Civil War, that there was a lot that was going on in the background and he's like, I want no part of it, or didn't agree. One or the other, history kind of writes itself. So um, in 1898, he sold it to his son, I Ira Shattuck, most likely his son because he given me any six children, although I have not been able to find. Oh, no, I did find a list. So it, Ira was his. He sold it to not only Ira, but on the list was also uh, um, Oscar, his son. So he sold it to two of his daughters and his son. And uh, in 1903, Ira sold the building to Ellie and Jabez E. Wilkes. And uh, for those uh, that, that don't know, that they were very prominent in basically having uh, a lot of map making in Washington County. Um, and they incorporated themselves. Um, I found in, uh, in the Sunday Oregonian that they incorporated themselves and founded the Wilkes Brothers Abstract Company. They created Alice's and Maps for Washington County in 1909. Yeah, incredible. So, um, what a gift. And here we end. So what I did want to mention about, where where does this lead me? So all the history, and it, and it goes up to Dr. Harvey. So Dr. Harvey, and I wanted, and I see, see Dirk, oh, the, um, so Dirk was the amazing, I would say, most amazing realtor I have ever had the privilege of meeting. <laughs> And I say that because of his passion for history, which equates to mine. Yeah. Um, Dirk um, not only kind of opened the door for me to allow me to kind of venture into uh, the history of this building, but was also a big champion of what I wanted to do with this building, uh, which was not only save it, um, but uh, then open it to the public as a nod to what it used to be. Uh, Dr. Harvey, who was part, who owned the building for almost half the building's life from 1953 to, to literally 2012 when he passed away, um, their family made it possible for me to have purchased the building. I could not have afforded it otherwise. Um, I'm on a rice and beans budget, basically. <laughs> and um, they... They were very, very gracious. They believed in the vision of what I want to do. So what do I want to do? This is a little hint. <laughs> uh, I am opening 
Um, it's twofold. So I'm opening um, the historic tea house. And the historic tea house will be taking the building back to 1891. And in its process, we will be, um, my culinary skills come into play. I actually brought a little something, uh, if, you, if you're curious, but it'll be foods where you get to experience tea house. Everybody knows what a tea house is. Tea used to be a very prominent part of everyday life for people. Before, it, and then coffee kind of caught in. And then tea came back again, and then coffee, and it, there, there's a rotation of basically how they all came to be. Um, but foods evolving around history. Um, and uh, for instance, the food that Napoleon ate, the food that George Washington sat down to uh, when the British were finally kicked out. Do you know how he celebrated? With a carrot cake. <laughs> In particular, uh, I have the recipe actually. So all of these nuances and trying to share that part of history where people actually get to experience history through food is what I want to do um, because it's a completely different flavor, sense. Um, things that evoke your childhood memories are so different back then than they are today. Um, and that's what I want to bring. So that said, I'm super excited. Thank you so much, EJ, for the, all the grant writing stuff you did. She made this, I'm, I'm going to try not to cry. She made this very possible for me. Um, it's a dream. Um, we'll be taking collections if we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Woo! Too many times people try to erase history and they can't. Yeah. Um, in erasing history, we erase ourselves. And so this is where I I reach out and try to basically bring where we celebrate history. Yes, it's dirtier versions, but also it's wondrous versions. So um, I brought to you, you we'll, we'll, we'll um, have a little later. So this, I brought spoons. This is a 200 year old recipe. It's not 200 years old. <laughs> no food poisoning here. Um, this is a 200 year old recipe of apple butter. Apple butter was first created in the Middle Ages in monasteries when they had apple orchards and needed to preserve them. And then they made their way over to the United States during the pioneer times and basically during the exploration. I invite you, what's very special about this is that there's no sugar in it, added, I should say. Apples naturally have their own sugar. Sugars have changed in the amount that we eat today. Um, the sugar um, that we had about 100 years ago, your average person consumed about uh, 8 to 10 pounds of sugar. Today, your average person consumes 86 pounds of sugar a year. So that tells you how food has changed. And so I want to celebrate basically going back to the roots of when you think of farm to table and organic and all that stuff, it was being done a lot, a lot more than people realized back then. So thank you very, very much for letting me speak. And if you want to try the apple, but I brought spoons and stuff, no double dipping. <laughs> yes. You think that your story was twofold. You told us the first part. What's the second part though? Twofold, yes, thank you. The second part is, so the downstairs will be, will be the restaurant, cafe, so to speak, the historic cafe. And so will the upper half of the front where you saw the fireplace. We're rebuilding the, the balcony. We'll be bringing back the balcony, which, which will be absolutely lovely. We're putting in a dumb waiter. We're wanting to put in a dumb waiter. We're wanting to basically make it as authentic. And then the other half will be a studio for artists and writers struggling off, uh, writers um, who have, need a place to basically finish a project and can't afford to. A lot of people don't know that your average writer makes $2.10 an hour. And so I am here eyewitness to that and um, was very fortunate then to sell my book but not many writers are fortunate to do that and so I want to give back to the artist artist community in that way so. yay